Hi, I'm Dr. Bill Adams, and we have a really special plastic surgery channel roundtable for you today. This is on maximizing breast implant patient safety with a special emphasis on breast implant associated ALCL. And we have some very special guests with us here today who have traveled all the way to Dallas uh, to, to share some experiences and knowledge with us. And, and actually, these three patients are, are all patients who have had breast implant ALCL. And uh, Michelle and Terry and Jennifer, thank you so much for coming. And it's going to be a, be a great discussion. We were going to start off talking about awareness, you know, and I think, Michelle, I'll, I'll start with you. You know, one of the things and we were talking earlier is just the whole thing that you're seeing, and we'll get to your Facebook group, but delays in treatment. Um, so why don't you share a little bit of insights with, with our, our viewers about uh, that? Sure. Um, you know, Dr. Adams, my, my symptoms were, I was symptomatic for about three years before I even learned about BIA ALCL. Uh, what concerns me about that is that my symptoms were very similar and the same of all the other women diagnosed. I had um, off and on swelling in my right breast. I had major itching. My itching would just wake me up in the middle of the night and I would scratch like crazy. Inside the breast, I had pain and aching. I went to my general practitioner with these con with these all these symptoms at the same time and she also sent me to a dermatologist and they were determined that I had shingles and that's what I was treated for for a year and since that they didn't subside I then went to a plastic surgeon my plastic surgeon who um, just he thought that I had a very low grade um, capsular contracture again same symptoms identified um, still not happy with that because my symptoms were still here and they were very an just antagonizing me. <laughs> um, then finally my breast, my right breast, really got the size of a basketball, I mean volleyball, it was just humongous. And it was an onset of a swelling just in December of this last year. Um, from there they found a seroma. That's finally when um, a seroma was identified through an ultrasound. And um, from there a needle aspiration. and from there, which came back negative. <laughs> and then from there, two weeks later, I did a bilateral capsulectomy and that, that of course, um, came back for me being positive with my tissues. And you know, like Terry, the, you all have a very big, very active Facebook group. Um, we're gonna talk about that later, but you have learned a lot of things from different patients' experiences, and this is not an uncommon story. No, I think Michelle's, Michelle's story is probably the most common story and, and you know, to the Facebook group, um, ironically, we're celebrating patient number 100 this month. And I heard as of this morning, it was patient number 101. And two years ago, there was 10 of us. And so one of the benefits of patients is that, you know, when you show up and, and women like Michelle to say, here's my symptoms, here's everything I've done so far, and, you know, we get to redirect you, mm -hmm. hopefully. And, and, you know, Michelle was, fortunate enough to be to be diagnosed right. after she got informed and was empowered she was diagnosed and then right and I just want to highlight Michelle you were diagnosed in 2018 yes this year January. and and your um, diagnosis was of capsule tissue but you had actual masses this wasn't the you know early stage situation yeah which we know is very important and I think I think one of the emphasis of this program is really to, to create some awareness about um, this topic, you know, even though it is in the in the plastic surgery society educational meetings, it's it's you know front and center and it's there. You all have seen a lot of different people's stories, and and, it, and there's there's certainly still a lack of uh, physician awareness, um, and we're trying to get more patient awareness as well. So in terms of the physician awareness in the plastic surgery community, in the past couple of years, there's been a big push to educate surgeons, but patients are seeing a lot of different types of physicians with, right. with sometimes some symptoms about their breasts, correct? Correct. And it's not just the physicians we see. It's the physicians behind the scenes. It's the radiologists. Um, radiologists that missed Jennifer's seroma on her MRIs um, that could have been detected earlier. Um, pathologists 
who are not testing our fluid right by not following the correct guidelines. Um, in my case, enough fluid was sent in, but not enough was tested when it finally went to the lab. My breast surgeon put everything on there that she should have correctly, but when the labs did test my fluid, they, did, they didn't test them right. So it's not just the physicians that we're seeing every day, it's the physicians out there that they work with, it's their partners that they're passing on, uh, passing their patients on to are they doing the right thing? Are they looking for the right things? Right, and if, if patients uh, that are breast implant patients, it is a, this thus, thus far has been a textured um, issue associated with textured implants, but all breast implant patients should know that you know, it's an ongoing thing. We call it breast health, breast implant patient health. They should continue to have follow-up with their surgeons. They should know if they have any symptoms, so let's talk about that for a minute. If, if, what types of symptoms are we concerned about to tell a breast implant patient if you have these things? So in, in your, your group, what are the different symptoms people have had that are presented with, with this? Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> you know, part Swelling. of the problem is, right, the, the seroma, the most popular. We, yeah. uh, we had a woman watch a media broadcast. Her only symptom was a hard lump under her armpit. Yeah. That, that lymph node was then diagnosed with CD30, and, and she, uh, so, so we've, we have that. We have women with low-grade capsular contracture who have, you know, that would have been an early symptom. And so, it, you know, typically lymphoma has things like nauseousness, fevers, night sweats, overall fatigue and malaise. I think for the average woman who is perhaps working outside the home or not, like, you know, we're busy, we're tired. So where do you draw that line? But they, that we've seen some traditional lymphoma symptoms present for some women without any of the unique breast symptoms. A seroma, which is a fluid collection around the, the breast implant, that's something that can be evaluated usually just by ultrasound and then the fluid can be taken off and sent off for testing. But there are some patients I think that are being told that that's okay to have fluid around the implant, correct? That you that's guys correct. have seen that. So that's definitely a big educational point I think that we'd want to get across that any, really any fluid around the breast implant um, is not normal. Should be aspirated. And, right. and it really should be evaluated regardless. Even, I mean in all these cases they have been associated with patients with textured implants but you know any patient with uh, fluid around the implant should be evaluated by aspirating it and then sending that off. Yeah, we see a lot of patients who have had like one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, and then they have the diagnosis. So there's definitely something brewing long before perhaps even a pathology could, di could diagnose it. Yeah, and it may, it may, most patients clinically, they have a seroma, you know, and if it's tested and say it's negative for CD30 or any kind of abnormal so cells in cytology, most of those patients, if not 100%, at least in my experience, have been some sort of infectious thing, and they, and they all actually are best treated by capsulectomy because that's how we treat, whether it's capsular contracture or just a infectious thing that recurs. So, the treatments are very similar, but the, the, I think the, the biggest point is that if people are going in the emergency room uh, or to their OBGYN, you know, for those non, say non plastic surgeons, if somebody has that, they probably need to be referred to a plastic surgeon that can definitively diagnose the patient and treat them. All right. Right. And the facts are evolving. I think, you know, all of our individual stories, you know, we, we know them all because, you know, I, I have retired from my job and I have a lot of time in my hands to, to listen and interact with all these women from all over the world telling me their stories. And this is happening in real time. And so it, it's not static, but they can refer their patient to our Facebook group. And, um, you know, as just a gesture of, of maximizing the patient's knowledge so they're making a true informed choice. Right. And I think, you know, so we have physician awareness and certainly um, we know that, you know, diagnosing people quickly and if they get the proper treatment quickly, they actually do really well. Um, and so that's, that's the reason to make this, this push. But then, Terry, you mentioned the, the empowered patient because patients also have a role to really know about some of these things. Like, for example, we already talked about, like, if you have a seroma, that's not normal. And so even if 
you know, somebody that you see said, oh, it's okay, it's really not okay until it's evaluated. So having patients to know, a breast implant patient should know some basic things and, and that empowerment of patients has become very important. Yeah. An empowered patient means that when you hear something that doesn't feel right, things like you know, fluid and, and swelling is normal, an empowered patient is going to be able to say, that's unacceptable. I'm therefore now going to go and seek out a plastic surgeon that perhaps understands this better. Because when I'm hearing some of that narrative that, that this group is saying is unacceptable, and it's unacceptable because plastic surgeons who know are telling us, like, we don't make this up. We follow the NCN, NCCN guidelines. We follow the bleeding edge research around the world. Not leading, but bleeding. You know, we dialogue and interact with surgeons like yourself and Dr. Clemens and Dr. Diva. And, you know, to your credit, you'll engage with us. So, you know, we're, we're in the trenches. And, and let's, you, you mentioned the NCCN guidelines. So, you know, we've, I mean, 10 years ago, nobody talked about breast implant ALCL. Now, you know, there is awareness and not, not enough yet, I think, for surgeons or patients, but, you know, we're working on that. Um, but we do, we have learned that it's a surgical treatment. Once, once somebody has a diagnosis, it's surgical treatment. Um, hopefully it's caught early in its early stage and it, and it can be cured by a capsulectomy. But you all, I think, have seen some patients who have had some problems maybe getting to somebody that will do a total capsulectomy and I think that's really important. You really do need to do a complete capsulectomy. Yeah. So, you know, I, and, and I was fortunate to have a plastic surgeon who really did a, an excellent uh, bilateral, bilateral capsulectomy, 100%, um, in removing my scar tissue. But a lot, of, a lot of the women that we're speaking to, they will go into a plastic surgeon and they'll, the plastic surgeon will tell them, or, or whoever the, the, the surgeon is, that once they get in there, they're not comfortable because they're, their scar capsule is adhered to their rib cage and that they can't remove it all. So they went ahead and, 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 and closed them up. And we have one patient right now or one, one of the ladies in our group who, who was diagnosed with BIA ALCL and she still has that part of that capsule still remaining in her. So the next step that was done, the surgery was done before her PET scan and, and we really need to make sure that if there is a chance that a woman has um, BIA ALCL that the protocol is being followed before the surgery whether it's a PET scan an MRI it's something that's going to um, get them steered in the right direction to the right doctor who has either seen this before or who knows about it so that they're able to make that decision during surgery the right. correct decision right oncology workup right so yes. so that the odd thing about our lymphoma is that most lymphomas don't have a surgical solution so you have these amazing lymphoma oncologists who treat with radiation and treat with chemotherapy. And now you have this unique entity that has, it's a lymphoma, but we have a surgical solution, but not before the oncology workup. Because a surgeon, it makes common sense to me that a surgeon going in for a total capsulectomy who knows that this patient has cancer is going to be doing a more complete job, a job that includes mar clear margins, is going to, I would just assume that any job that I go into informed, that, I'm, I, that I know how to approach that job. And so clear margins are definitely something that we didn't talk about two years ago. There were no NCCN guidelines, you know, until two years ago. So we're just saying that this whole, you know, plastic surgery seems to be th the best place for diagnostic criteria to be followed. If it's not, find another one. If you unfortunately do end up with a diagnosis, then you should be sent over to, to lymphoma oncology and then work together with your plastic surgeon. Yeah, and I think certainly your, the Facebook page is a, is a good resource for any patient that is seeking to find some center or physician or, or testing uh, to, to be appropriately diagnosed. So I think that's a good resource. Certainly patients could go to the plastic surgery channel and we're happy to, to guide patients. But I think go, getting the right steps done is very important. And luckily, again, like you said, Terry, this is a, its own entity. It's not really like other things. Uh, there's some similarities, but 
and, and, and the good thing is when, when the steps are followed, the patients do really well, which is great. But when the steps aren't followed, then that's when problems have been seen. And, and it, I mean, women have died. And women, um, you know, one of the other, you know, scary groups of women out there are women who the illness has spread. And so when they present, they present to an oncologist with systemic disease. And that oncologist, if they're unaware, may not know that removing that implant may be the key to their successful response to treatment.